Hello and welcome to the Eastern Front. This is Yulia Zhoja with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington Universities, and I'm joined by my colleague Giselle Donnelly. I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. On our podcast, we talk about the many challenges to European peace that tend to emerge along a line running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front and about why those matter to the United States. If you enjoy this episode, as always, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Today, we're joined by Andres Ilvis, who is the Regional Director for Near East at Radio for Europe Radio Liberty, overseeing and providing support on the services of Iran, Afghanistan, and Northwest Pakistan. And he's previously worked at BBC World Service, overseeing Pashto, Persian, and many other services and works. Andres, it's great to have you with us. We're thrilled for you to join us to talk to us a little bit about Iran, Iran in Eastern Europe at large, Iran and Russia. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And it's certainly a topic that I'm glad that you're covering because it's timely. It's sometimes perceived to be at the fringes of uh, what the world is most focused on, of course, at the moment, namely the ongoing full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the war between Israel and Hamas. Those conflicts, of course, are at the forefront of what the world is paying attention to. But yes, the role of Iran is, in fact, always there in the background in different ways. It is a player on the scene, and it's quite insightful, if I may <laughs> say, of you to focus on that here, because it does really have a role. It's a player on the international scene. I should add that anything I say here is, of course, my own view. We do broadcast every day, 24 hours a day, in Dari and Pashto in Persian, as you said, and uh, we have lots of output for this region of the world. I am responsible for it at the same time I'm speaking, of course, just uh, as myself. Let's start broad with Russia and Iran. As you already alluded to, it gets downplayed because, of course, Russia is the main actor in the full-scale invasion. But as I see it, Iran, through this war, is actually becoming a bit of a threat to NATO itself, right? We've seen the most obvious connection is the Shahid drones, um, but the Shahid drones are falling increasingly on NATO territory and are threatening NATO territory and, of course, wreak havoc in the war in Ukraine itself. And that's the lens that we're focusing on. So maybe we can start with that. I remember at the beginning from the open source information, we found out that Iran is delivering these kamikaze drones to Russia and then that they are building them. And there was a bit of a rumor here and there, where will they build them? Where will they build the factory? And from what I remember, the Iranians were trying to build a factory or decide on a place in Russia for the factory that is majority Muslim. They actually tried, if I remember correctly, to do it in the Northern Caucasus in Dagestan. And the Russians probably thought that's a bit too dangerous, too close to it. And so they decided on Tatarstan further away from the war in the Black Sea region, but also majority Muslim. So would you say that the drone angle is the one that is the best to understand what is going on in the relationship between Russia and Iran in the context of the full-scale invasion? In the context of the full-scale invasion, yes. I think we should, in order to understand what's really going on, just pause for a moment on just the general relationship between Iran and Russia. Russia. And how is it to use the phrase that Nelson Mandela used at his inauguration? He said that apartheid South Africa had been the skunk of the world. And if you look at the fact that Russia, because it is pretty isolated in the aggressive war that it is waging, it has turned to other countries who are essentially equally isolated and have been isolated for different reasons, namely North Korea, Iran. So this is not exactly an, an ideological alliance. In fact, it's not a formal alliance, and yet it is one of convenience. It isn't limited to this war. It began quite some time ago, depending on how far back you want to go in history. But the relationship between Russia, Iran, and Iran is not an obvious one. 
it is certainly one of convenience. If nothing else, they certainly like to poke and prod at so their mutual enemies. In this case, I would say, broadly speaking, it is the West. So that underpinning what we see with the support that Iran is providing to Russia, it's essentially, I wouldn't call it a marriage of convenience, I would call it a perhaps dating of convenience. But in the larger context, there's cooperation, of course, between the two that's taking place in Syria. There are different types of cooperation that have taken place. They, of course, are both oil and gas producers and so on. But very specific in the context of the war, I mean, frankly, considering some of the issues that Russia has had in waging the war with its own weapons supply and so on, Iran was certainly an obvious place for them to turn. There are different camps within the leadership in Iran. We pretty much can assume from trying to analyze statements and so on about how close this relationship should really be, because there is a lot of suspicion, despite the fact that they do have this relationship of convenience. There is certainly, especially considering some of the history, there's a lot of skepticism involved as well, uh, certainly on the Iranian side of how close they should actually be to Russia. Would you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because I think that's quite interesting. Obviously, until the full-scale invasion, the relationship had been very much of Iran being the junior in it, and the increasing reliance of Russia on Iran has maybe balanced that out a little bit more. But from what I know, Iran has historic, recent historic reasons to believe that they shouldn't be trusting Russia as much because Russia, at least in their understanding, has been throwing them under the bus quite a few times. So can you talk a little bit more about that for us to understand better the context of where they're coming from? Absolutely. I think one of the key things, it reminds you a bit of Afghanistan during the Soviet period and now Iran since the fall of the Soviet Union, namely that it really used to be a matter of you know, Iran and then one big neighbor. And I know we're going to touch on on the Caucasus uh, later on. But now they're not facing kind of necessarily a, a bilateral relationship, but they have in the past. There was the Russian Empire and the Persian Empire, and the history has not been good. I mean, as recently as the Second World War, the Soviet Union had military forces in Iran that caused deaths among Iranians and so on. Somehow, at the same time, the mistrust on the part of Iran has been focused primarily on the UK and the US. But there's a lot of mistrust and yes, there is a feeling that Russia doesn't necessarily have Iran's best interests in mind. And for that reason, it's been more on a tactical level that they've worked together. Now, having said that, it's been increasing over time and Iran has been flexing a bit of its muscle more and trying to also spread out its relationship. I think one of the key things to think about it, and it perhaps sounds contradictory, but on the one hand, it would appear that the primary foe in their eyes is the West. And again, by that, I mean the US, the UK, NATO, and so on. And at the same time, it's now a multipolar world, as we know. So Iran has signed a 25-year agreement with China. There's just so much, I would say, confusion going on that it's a bit dizzying. Again, a lot of the changes happening has been very recent. And in the Caucasus, we have this warming of relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia, which certainly no one predicted. And I referred earlier to two camps. There really are two groups based on their view of how deep the relationship should be in the Iranian leadership, basically posing the question, should we be really close and view Russia as a trusted partner or at least one of utility? And that includes probably the supreme leadership of the Islamic Republic that are basically, well, we need Russia, we need this ally, we're suffering from sanctions together and so on. And then we have a second camp that's somewhat more skeptical and doesn't want to go too deep in that relationship. And that includes the former president, Rouhani, former foreign minister, Zarif and so on. I'd like to push this a little bit more in the context of a perception that the United States is tiring, internally divided, and that the unipolar moment, if not over, is shaky. What I sort of see is that there's something beyond just the transactional relationship here. It's not, you know, blood brothers, we stand, we fall as one kind of a thing. But there's, a, I think, an understanding that there's a geopolitical opportunity to undermine the West. Walter Russell Mead calls these guys, guys the excess of weevils boring into the roots of the international system. It's a memorable phrase. 
And particularly when you also sort of contemplate the Chinese role as sort of now the senior partner, you know, you could almost rank Iran number two and Russia as number three in this because Russia is so focused on Ukraine and its power projection capabilities are, are so limited. And the last bit about it is that it seems like there's a huge amount of churn, both ongoing and foreseeable not only in the Caucasus, but Central Asia, let's call it inner Eurasia, where these three traditional empires sort of meet. Just, Andre, if, if you react to that and tell me if I'm crazy or, or what's your take on all that? You're right. You know, the other day I was musing about the fact that uh, it may not be in the memory of many people, but once upon a time there was a Cento, remember the Central Treaty Organization, there was this CETO, and that so many things that seemed firm and clear. So it's not just a matter of the Cold War and all that, but there have been so many alliances and understandings that have shifted. And it's true. Look at BRICS, right? So we can't yet assess what it really means, the expansion of it now. I mean, the vast expansion of it last year and what that really means. But it does certainly speak to the fact that there's just a lot of scrambling going on and a lot of alliance building to try to, I don't know whether it's to isolate the West or whether it's simply to say we're moving on from the West. And certainly there's a mantle that the Soviet Union tried to claim for itself of championing and being the liberation theology of the third world. I think that there is a bit of that going on, except that it's not underpinned by ideology. It's far more mercenary. You can find the influence of China. I mean, certainly if you look at Africa, the role is extraordinary that China now plays. And they're trying to increase their influence and it's not really clear how it's going to play out but you know you travel and you see people from different countries you look at the role of turkey in the region certainly turkey is increasing its role i mean the fact that turkey can now be having any type of conversation with armenia is kind of mind-blowing right and yet that's actually happening it, it happened this month there were serious talks going on so i agree with you entirely it's such a multipolar world i can't even quite pin down how many poles there are it's interesting the way you rank the countries in terms of Russia and China and Iran. And that, that may really end up being the case. It's not so clear that Iran is that much stronger. But to say that they're sort of close is a big change. Russia, a former global superpower. So if Russia's fallen, Iran has also stepped forward. It has stepped forward. And it's interesting, there is this, I don't think there's an ideology, certainly or arguably there's no ideology that Russia and Iran have in common. There is a narrative, though, of being the true believer, if you look at the kind of the orthodox narrative that Putin draws on, but there's this idea that somehow civilization, certainly Russian or Slavic civilization's repository is now Russia and all of the stuff that Vladimir Putin tries to draw on. There's a similar narrative, very, very broadly speaking, that takes place in Iran being a Shia state. We are the true believers. We are beleaguered. We're in a sea of Sunnis and so on. Um, there, There's a, a certainly a similar Similarity there. Frankly, for lack of a better word, it's a sense of victimhood. But I think that Iran can probably take that much further because we all know the malign influence or tentacles that the Putin regime has all over the world. Obviously, as we all know, Iran is doing the same thing. Iran has its various alliances, overt ones, assistance, covert assistance, and so on. So we're, of course, now operating a world as well that isn't one that's about open alliances and so on. There's a lot of covert stuff going on. I want to build a little bit more on, before we move to other countries, South Caucasus, etc., a little bit more on the Russia-Iran relationship in terms of this, what shall I call it, religious ideology clash or cooperation. And I guess I'm wondering to what extent from the understanding that you have of what is going on in Tehran in terms of the logic, to what extent does the Iranian leadership, the decision makers feel threatened by Russian expansionism because they are overlapping and they have been competing, as you suggested, for a long time before they started cooperating. And to what extent are they comfortable with on the ground working between Shia and Russian Orthodoxy? I remember the first one is 2015, Russia moves into Syria and with the first paratroopers at the suggestion of the Iranians, right? And, and with the 
the first paratroopers from Russia come the Russian priests that have been working on the ground with the Islamic Guard ever since. And I don't think we have a clear understanding of how that worked in terms of, you know, how comfortable one is with one another on the ground. And then the second thing is, how does Iran think about Russia? I feel like their ambition vis-a-vis -vis influence in Russia has increased due to Russia's vulnerability or weakness in the full-scale invasion. It was about one year ago that Russia has permitted for the first time outside forces, specifically Iran and China, to help them dredge the Volga Don Canal in the Caucasus that connects the Caspian Sea to the Black Sea that is very tight, that I think was initially created by the Ottoman Empire back in the day. How ironic is that? But they would need this canal to be able to transport more of the ships from one place to the other um, because it's very tight. And so they've invited Iran to kind of build onto sovereign Russian territory, whether it's the drone factory or the dredging of the Volga Don Canal. And so I'm describing these examples because I'm wondering from the Iranian position, what does that look like? Is that a real shift that they consider to be maybe a springboard for more influence into Russia and into that specifically Eurasian region where they have not been this present, focusing more on the South traditionally and the Sunni world? Or is it just a coincidence and you don't see that as the strategic endeavor that the Iranians are having? I think that Iran is not shy about extending its influence. And I think that it does it in different ways. Some of it can be cultural. You certainly do see the presence of the Iran you did during the time of the Republic that preceded the takeover by the Taliban, you clearly could see efforts by the Iranian regime, again, bearing in mind the Shia-Sunni difference, but that nonetheless, you travel in the region and you do see Iranian cultural centers and so on. And so I think, for example, in Central Asia, you do see it, can't really speak to how effective it is, but certainly in Tajikistan, for example, because of the language relationship between Persian and Tajik, you can definitely see some cultural efforts and so on. So I don't think that they're only looking south. Like for example, Turkey probably, in the view of some people, missed an opportunity after the fall of the Soviet Union to extend its influence in Central Asia, which would have been a somewhat obvious thing to do, but it basically didn't. And now it is. Certainly you see the Turkish role has grown. I think that the same can be said for Iran. They're not going to pass up those opportunities, whether they be the cultural ones I mentioned or the you know, more economic or resource-based ones that you alluded to. I don't think they're going to turn away from that at all. But there is a question, which I think you alluded to as well, how far that can really extend, because if it is primarily ideologically a religious-based, a religion-based regime, there's a limit to how far that can extend. I do think there's one thing, which is this idea of the third world, of liberation movements, BRICS, countries that lie outside the pole. It could be formerly colonized countries, however it is that they want to view it. I think that there is a bit of a narrative out there where Iran is trying to take up that mantle and you know, represent. I mean, you'll, you'll find it in the war now, you know, Israel-Gaza, because there isn't necessarily any inherently close link between Iran and Hamas on the surface, other than the fact that they're Muslims. But I think that, again, the, the Shia-Sunni difference doesn't make it an obvious relationship. And yet, at the same time, it's not clear the extent, but there certainly has been a lot of support and so on. So I think that, and especially the narrative that Iran pushes, is one of it's very anti-Western and so anti-Western than, you know, here we are and where we've been oppressed and so on, and we, we feel your pain, etc. I would say that both Russian Orthodoxy as it is now, and Homanism, if we can call it that, have a really strong element of nationalism, almost imperialism, that in many ways is, I don't want to say the largest influence on religious structures and religious propaganda, but it's close. So as long as you have two national churches that find it easier to set their doctrinal or confessional particularities to the side for the purposes of geopolitical cooperation. Again, beyond the one-off transactional, I'll scratch your back, you scratch my back. So. That's a very good point. I think that there is 
a resonance, even if there's literally no overlap per se between the two faiths and so on. But you do have regimes that, that have a narrative that's based on history and religion and so on. Lost greatness. Yes, exactly. And I think that sometimes, I mean, you look at meetings that take place among certain political parties that are very, for lack of a better word, nationalist in Western Europe. And because they're very inwardly focused, at first glance, you one couldn't see what they have in common. And yet they get together because they do have, you know, what they say into their own countries in their domestic politics, that feeling and that ethos that, that they're appealing to does resonate with each other. So I think by the same token, even though there's obviously no inherent ideological relationship between Russia and Iran today, there is that sense, as you said, of, of lost greatness, beleaguered, both have kind of the, the West writ large as the boogeyman. So yeah, and I think these points are important so that it's not just, oh, we have oil, you have oil, you know, let's go for it. But there's also that tension, as we were talking about earlier, there's a tension of the history and some mistrust. I'm not sure that the, Russia has a mistrust toward Iran per se, because it's been a relatively minor player. But if you look at the Caucasus, we have this whole question of the rather significant Azeri population in Iran. So quite famously, Iran's population is ranges have included as low as 50% ethnically Persian, if you will. Sometimes people use higher figures. But no matter what, how you look at it, there is a very large Azeri ethnic group in Iran, not to mention loads and loads of other groups. I mean, for example, we have the Kurds. There's a significant Arab population. And I think that the way that the Soviet Union behaved, even setting up a short-lived uh, kind of Soviet Azeri Republic inside Iranian territory after the Second World War, that is certainly something. And when you talk about the South Caucasus, that is certainly a concern as well. It is an ongoing issue that lurks beneath the surface. You know, irredentism, possibly, and the shift in power relations in the South Caucasus between Armenia and Azerbaijan and so on. I mean, there's so much going on. <laughs> in the region. Basically, it's like you take a deck of cards and just throw them in the air and see what falls face up and then proceed from there. Well, actually, why don't you uh, tell us which way the cards are facing? <laughs> yes, there really was an important development that, uh, that I alluded to earlier as well. The, the top diplomats of Armenia and Turkey met on the 1st of December, and they basically stated their intention to fully normalize relations. Well, I don't have to tell you how amazing that actually is. I mean, on so many different levels. Most obviously, there's the fact that these two countries that have been historically inimical toward each other for well over a century, depending on how, how far back you want to go, that they suddenly want to normalize their relations. And I think that that, in terms of Iran wanting to be the big player in the region, where it historically has been, because the South Caucasus has a far longer history with Iran than it does with Russia. And Armenia basically feeling that it's been let down by Russia. And so, you know, apparently, well, if at minimum, it looks as though they're warming up their relations with Turkey, they may be turning toward the West. And that's not good news for Tehran. And at the same time, you have Azerbaijan, that Iran has always been skeptical about the ideology of, if you will, because they have historically been, been friendly with Israel. And of course, as I mentioned, there's the Azeri minority along the border and so on. Well, for quite a big stretch of Iran. So all of this stuff actually can make Iran and does make Iran nervous. And this goes back to the issue. This is something they never had to deal with when it was a big Soviet Union next door. Then it's just this big country next door with a border that, that is you know, fixed and so on. And now we have these shifting alliances and changes between Armenia and Azerbaijan and transit corridors. All of this is dramatically changing how things look to Iran, I would say. So then can you explain to us why it is that Iran has been rather of an absent player in the last few years in the South Caucasus, particularly looking through the Nagorno-Karabakh War 2020 and then 2023, Armenia at least formally having some kind of a partnership, military cooperation, if not alliance with Iran. Iran feeling threatened by Israel's influence in Azerbaijan. They've shown that. They've had the biggest military exercise, I think it was 2022, at the border to Azerbaijan to kind of posture, but they haven't lifted a finger 
trigger to help Armenia in any way. Rather, they've stayed completely absent. Apart from the boilerplate, uh, we support Azerbaijan territorial integrity, etc. They've really been absent from the conflict. And it looks from what you're describing that the vacuum that is created by Russia's overstretch in the region is filled by Turkey rather than Iran. And Turkey and Iran have a complicated relationship that is rather about competition. Iran wants less transit fees and more access via Turkish territory. Traditionally, the Turks are pushing against Iran on several areas. So is it that Iran is overstretched itself or doesn't, is it confused? Doesn't it know what to do in the South Caucasus? Or how do you interpret this rather passive role that they have adopted in the end in terms of reaching out to Armenia or trying to play more of an active role in the peacemaking process, whatever that might be. How do you make sense of all of that? Iran did support Armenia, as you said. They did supply arms. I think the reason that it essentially went not as noticed was because Azerbaijan got a lot more help from Israel and, and from other countries and so on. And I think that Iran has been very careful to try to maintain a balance there because it doesn't want to have hostile relations with Baku. So it, it's had to find a way to play off both. So official support for Armenia, arms for Armenia, but not too many, certainly not enough for Armenia to win that particular war. I think that there's also a question about a war happening right on Iran's borders. I think that not to be underestimated is the effect of the the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s. I think that that really, as we know, left a deep imprint on the Iranian psyche. And I think that they probably didn't want to get drawn into that. And I would also say one reason they wanted to be careful about coming out too strongly on the side of Armenia is because of the Shia issue, because Azerbaijan is has such a strong Shia population. And it's something that would have been a bit odd for Iran to do, is to be a bit too enthusiastic in the support of a country or that's waging war against a neighboring Shia country. So I think a lot of factors that probably made it better for Iran to stay away. But now having done that, then the question is, what leverage does it have? There's been a vacuum that now it seems, again, not surprisingly, that Turkey is stepping into. So there's a bit of a dance going on. Is so They don't want to offend the Azeris too much. They're worried about the, the Shia in Azerbaijan, the Azeris in Iran. It's all a bit messy and a lot easier to deal with proxy wars that aren't near your border than it is to deal with a war right on your border. Let me toss a few hand grenades in here. It seems to me that a lot of people, possibly including the Iranians, have missed the relative rise of Azerbaijan, militarily speaking, and their habit of treating them as sort of a quasi-Turkish puppet is no longer the case. So you have a, an emerging regional power that took everybody by surprise with the aggression and and the competence of its military. And, you know, <laughs> Armenians are grasping at straws. So an Iranian straw could be better than a Russian straw these days. And as much as they're, you know, the easternmost outposts of Europe, the Europeans aren't going to help them, and neither are the Americans. So again, there's this regional flux that doesn't fit well into past power structures or alliance structures or the relationships of the past are not able to cope with the changing regional power dynamic. You know, so I guess the question is, what really can Iran bring to the table in rebalancing the region in a way that would suit them, that would save the Armenians, that would, you know, sort of deter further Azeri adventurism, and by the same token, sort of restrict Turkey from mischief. That's a lot. <laughs> No, no, I mean, and it's actually, uh, of course, it's hard to predict. If Iran were just, well, the equivalent of Georgia on the other side of, of Azerbaijan and Armenia, then there wouldn't really be an issue. The fact is that it wields such power, I agree, to have this large, ideologically motivated, powerful country next door in the form of Iran it has the potential to upset the apple cart, because actually if the Caucasus were left to its own devices, which is pretty inconceivable, 
possible. But if you just had Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia going their merry way, but of course we do have Russia neighboring in the north and Iran in the south. And now you have basically, I mean, it'll be interesting to see with the change configuration, because of course it's hard to overestimate what has now happened in Nagorno-Karabakh is that the dynamics have really changed. And if you have an Armenia that's turning away from Russia, then what role does Russia play? I agree that whether intentionally or not, they've been back-footed, that basically they're now responding to what Turkey is doing. They're going to respond to what Russia does. And because it's not really clear, I think that their whole policy in their caucuses was based on being close and friendly with Armenia. The visa regime between the countries, I mean, that's telling in itself. It's very easy to get a visa for Armenia as an Iranian citizen. It's okay, you can get a 45-day visa as an Iranian going to Georgia, and you have to get an e-visa to go to Azerbaijan. And if nothing else, that somehow summarizes the type of relationship that Iran has with the three countries. So then instead of the conclusions, let me ask you this question from, of course, from your understanding, but but trying to put yourself into Tehran's shoes. What would keep them up at night? What is it that they would be most worried about in either this space that we talked about, sort of north, northwest Caucasus, Russia, or... Or do you think it's something entirely different and most of their energy continues to focus southward? What should we be looking out for in terms of Iranian worries and focus? You can edit out that big sigh, by the way. That's the most eloquent answer of all. You know, one of the things that this regime for now 45 years has thrived on is having an enemy. It's built up the chance, death to Israel, death to America, and so on. It has managed to sustain an ongoing ideological war, if you will. And it was, well, it's very common. I mean, it's, it's basically how dictatorships and certainly totalitarian regimes stay in power as they find an enemy and so on. I think that, frankly speaking, the outcomes of the wars that are taking place, the two big ones that everybody's following, I think that they're trying to have an influence in both. I don't think that uh, it's quite clear to them what would be the ultimate positive outcome, because if there really is a defeat of Israel, whatever that would look like, well, then what do they do? I think it's not clear to them how they're going to benefit I mean, certainly they have helped with stoking the flames of these conflicts. I think that by arming Russia, they're helping prolong the war, frankly. How they benefit from it in the end isn't really clear, because you know, I don't think that there's a history of Russia necessarily showing gratitude for the help. So are they really better off if Russia wins that war, whatever that might even look like? That's not clear. How they would benefit, I think they can probably sleep better as long as there is ongoing conflict and they can help stoke the flames of it and keep providing surreptitious aid and so on, and just enough to keep the problems going. But you never know, of course, with any such thing, if there won't be blowback. So what might really happen? Unrest in the Caucasus, how would that have an effect inside Iran? Or people were even talking about Iran possibly invading Azerbaijan because of its relationship with Israel. I think, frankly, I mean, there is so much going on, the shifting of alliances and so on, that it's not really clear what will actually benefit Iran. Because at the end of the day, it is isolated and it has very strained and strange relationships with its neighbors and so on. I think that it's not clear what is going to sustain them. They're very much at the mercy of oil prices. I think there's a lot going on that worries them, but it also goes beyond the region. I think the ongoing sanctions, I think, frankly, if I can touch on this, what worries them is probably not even necessarily what's going on in the region and in the Caucasus and with Russia. Russia, they are probably very concerned about what is going to happen in certain rather major elections happening in the rest of the world. What's going to happen with JCPOA? I think that whether or not that's going to be revived or permanently scuttled, I think that that's going to be a key thing for them. I think the other stuff is perhaps a bit of noise, you know, they can fund here. I mean, 
their funding is obviously quite prodigious. I mean, the, the level of funding that they provide to different groups is, is staggering. By one estimate, $700 million to Hezbollah in one year alone, at the last time I saw it surveyed. So they're spending a lot of money stirring the pot, but I think that what really probably does worry them is that sanctions will really take their toll on the daily life of Iranians, that there could be more domestic unrest. Every few years, we look at something, and most recently the Mahsa Amini protests, and wonder whether this is going to be what brings about a significant change in, in Iran. And of course, in the event, each time it hasn't. I think if I were one of those people running the country with that type of ideology and so on, I would wonder whether one day the effect of the ideology that I'm imposing and making people live under, and that in the end, the attitude that is causing the West to react uh, in a certain way and to have a program that may or may not be preparing for a nuclear program, that the price that those policies exact is going to be... it's going to be a dramatic change. Uh, I would ask myself whether it's worth being a pariah in the world and suffering the consequences. And I think that the ultimate test is really going to be pragmatism versus ideology. Does this regime stick to such a harsh and rigid ideology that it risks completely alienating its own population to such an extent that the population can't take it anymore. I think arguably that's already happened and it's only security forces that sustain the regime, but things can change. And if I were one of those people, that's what would keep me up at night. Before we let you go, can you say a word about Iran's Eastern Front? You said you were up all night tracking Pakistan and Taliban exchanges of flowers and things like that across the border. Having a Taliban back in power in Kabul has got to be um, not a happy development from a Tehranian point of view. And of course, living next to Balochistan is never a recipe for a good sleep. So how does Iran rank developments on its eastern front? And how much does that divert attention in Tehran? Yes, they're not ideologically quite aligned with the Taliban. You know, all these countries manage to find a way, as we all know, to accommodate the realities. Sometimes the Venn diagram between the realities and the ideology um, is a very interesting one. So, of course, famously, the Taliban now, Taliban 2.0 and so on, they're not the same Taliban that um, killed a bunch of Iranians over two decades ago. But I think they are nervous. I I mean, frankly, there's another element to what makes uh, the Iranian regime nervous when it comes to the general region and the Eastern Front, and that has to do with Islamic State. As we know, in January... You know, took responsibility for an attack that killed over 80 people. Some form of it continues to operate in Afghanistan. I think that there is a nervousness. It goes back to what I alluded to earlier as well. Is so yes, you know, those forces quote won, but that's not necessarily the outcome that you necessarily want. Perhaps Iran was better off when there was an ongoing war to its east rather than a peace in the hands of a regime that isn't quite clear how to deal with. But that regime is. They're pragmatists. And frankly, there is, to the detriment of Afghans, a kind of united attitude by its neighbors to start sending Afghans back to to quite a prodigious extent. So more famously, because there was a deadline from Pakistan and now from Iran as well, they're literally sending Afghans back. And I think Iran just doesn't want to deal with its eastern front because, as you said, there's a lot of other stuff going on on its northern front and on its western front. Having said that, yes, there are. It's because of the makeup of Iran's population, and I mentioned the Arabs and the Azeris and the Kurds and so on. And as you mentioned, there there are the Baluch, and there was the attack across the border into Pakistan, and the Pakistan attack in Iran. And there's there's a lot of stuff going on that, frankly, I think they'd rather not deal with. Um, and that is probably another thing that, that keeps them up. At night. Thank you, Andres, for really a comprehensive world tour of Iran and for joining us. Thank you so much. From me, Yulia Zoja, and, and me, Giselle Donnelly. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us to stay up to date with the Eastern Front. Please give us a follow on Twitter or X at Eastern Front Pod, one word and sign up for our newsletter included in the show notes. You can find more episodes and additional content on our website, AI.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and until next time, goodbye.